Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> Um, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to, uh, to kind of contribute to this conversation. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be, be talking about is going to be uh, def directly related to uh, what Kate and Elizabeth both have already kind of offered up to you and um, perhaps take it a little bit further um, down the journey of how do we address the conservation needs of, of all the, the different species of, of forest birds in particular that we have here in the state of Vermont. So it turns out, as I'm sure most people here know, conservation is pretty complicated. Um, there's a lot of different aspects and, and facets to it, a lot of different disciplines that are going to be involved in, in the conservation of species. Um, we need to have that hard science, that research, that can help inform what we're going to do on the ground. We have a number of great organizations um, that are doing that work for us. Um, we need to have technical service providers that can then get that information out to the people that are making those decisions on the ground um, so that we're basing our decisions in the best science available. Um, we have to have um, community scientists, which is kind of the new term for citizen scientists, um, for uh, getting them involved and in, in helping to monitor uh, the response that, that birds and other wildlife are having to the things that we're doing. And then we have this whole other realm of, um, of public policy um, and advocacy that are all components of making sure that conservation is happening. So it's not just one thing that we need to be thinking about. And in the end, after we take all of these um, different facets of, of conservation together, they have one big thing in common. And that's what you see in these photos here. What does every one of those photos have in it? People, right? So conservation is about people. Okay, remember that. <laughs> All right. So we have done a really good job in many ways um, in, our, in our bird conservation here, not just in Vermont, but, but in all areas of, of the country. Um, and just kind of a little bit of a historical context, um, not related to, um, to only happening in the past, but also things that are programs that are happening here today. Um, we have had a lot of success with programs that look specifically at species that are um, of conservation concern, species that are in decline, um, or species that may have very specialized habitat requirements, uh, particularly during their breeding season. And so I wanted to kind of highlight some of, the, some of those programs that we've had, um, and Kate kind of was, was mentioning this, that the two different bird species that I'm highlighting here, I chose to not just put the the typical photo that is easy identification maybe um, up here. Uh, does anybody know what that top left photo is? There are actually birds in there. Woodcock. Right, the American woodcock, uh, the young that are well camouflaged. And then down on the bottom right, it's just a bunch of eggs laying on the ground. Um, so that's a, that is a roughed grouse um, nest and that was actually um, found at the Green Mountain Audubon Center, which is our Audubon Center out in, down in Huntington, um, right at the edge of some, some forest management that we had done a number of years ago. Um, and we took a tour of foresters in there one spring. Actually, Steve, you were on that tour. And certainly right there behind someone's feet was that nest of, uh, of the rough grouse. Um, so these sorts of conservation efforts have been, have been going on, ongoing and have been successful. But as we hear, some of these species are still in decline. And so we're not done yet. With, with thinking kind of that, that focal species or that, that perhaps a, a particular serial stage of habitat that those species utilize. So, um, so we have management efforts that are ongoing to create things like the young forest habitat, which is a critical and necessary part of the landscape um, that we want to see out there on the ground to support these species that are going to um, require that in order to keep going here in the state. In fact, even at Audubon, Vermont, we have um, something that fits into that, that model, kind of thinking of a particular species at risk that has a very specialized habitat requirement, and that's in the golden wing warbler. Um, this is a bird species that in Vermont is somewhat restricted um, to the highest population anyway, being in the, in the Champlain Valley. So we focus our conservation efforts to create that uh, shrubby sort of habitat condition that's adjacent to a more mature forest or closed canopy forest um, within that part of Vermont, as opposed to thinking about doing this up, thinking about managing for uh, golden wing warbler in the Northeast Kingdom, you can do all the same sorts of activities, and at least today, you're still not going to find that bird species up there. So, um, so we're working, Audubon's working on, on this particular bird as that kind of focal species or that particular habitat um, condition 
that certain birds require. And this focal species uh, uh, specific habitat condition approach works. I apologize, it probably washed out on the bottom what my words were there, bad color choice. Um, I think these work really well when the landowner whether that's a private landowner or whether it's a state agency or industrial ownership, whatever it might be, is particularly interested in birds. We know, in fact, from the, the, the data that Elizabeth talked about um, that many people are interested in birds. Um, or they're interested in that particular focal species, perhaps on a WMA, a wildlife management area. It's related to, um, to the game species that people enjoy out there. Um, or they like that required habitat. So we have that, that subset of people that this works really well for to think in these terms. Um, it also works well when the parcel that you're gonna be working on and the landscape in which that parcel sits is well suited to thinking about that. So go back to my example of golden wing warbler. Um, someone in the Northeast Kingdom might really like golden wing warbler, but their parcel is not gonna be suited to providing habitat for that particular species. There may be other birds, and there will be other birds and wildlife that use that, but it won't be the golden wing warbler. So the habitat, um, the context of the parcel and the landscape really needs to be supporting what it is that we're trying to see out there in the ground. And finally, uh, funding to support that management. Sometimes the, the, um, the efforts to create these habitats or enhance them do come at a cost to whoever it is that's conducting that work. And so there's funding mechanisms in place um, for creating certain types of conditions or for benefiting particular certain species on the landscape. So everything that, we've just, that I've just mentioned works well, in, particularly in these sorts of situations. What about the rest of us? What if we aren't that interested in creating uh, woodcock habitat or my property is actually not well suited to it? Um, because I have a really small piece of land. I don't like the idea of someone doing uh, a five-acre opening uh, that will regenerate into young forest habitat. Is there anything that I can do? Anything that's possible for me to think about? Any bird species I can think about um, that I feel like me as a person, which we know people are conservation, can have an impact on? And so this is where I kind of I, I titled this a, a paradigm shift. Maybe that really wasn't the best term to, to paradigm to use, but it's really kind of a maybe a different way of thinking. I'm going to suggest that as a conservation community, we kind of need to broaden our scope and our thinking about what bird conservation means. And in fact, sometimes bird conservation might not even mean talking about birds, at least not in the beginning. We need to be able to respond to the threats of the day. I mean, that's really, when, when it comes to conservation, we, we think, you know, it's, it's about habitat for a particular species, in this case, forest. Um, so we need to think about the forest and what are the threats today to forests and henceforth the birds and other wildlife that are going to use them. Obviously, the big one of the day, the theme of this conference today, uh, climate change. Uh, this is from the Audubon, National Audubon website report on climate change, 314 species on the brink. So that's kind of uh, denoting that climate change really is thought to be one of the biggest um, issues facing bird conservation everywhere into the future. So we need to think, if we're going to be thinking about birds and habitat and engaging people and thinking about what they can do, we have to think about what climate is going to be doing to them to those forests that those birds need. On the right, forest ownership patterns. We know that parcel sizes continue to get smaller. Um, we know that the, the fragmentation of our forests is continuing. Um, how do we get people to um, think about those threats and to think about management that is going to address that, that particular threat? On the bottom, we knew it was coming and it's came, right? The emerald ash borer is here. We have other um, both native and non-native insects, which are impacting our forests, and therefore the birds that are coming along to utilize those forests. And we also have plenty of non-native and invasive plant species that are also going to be changing the quality of the habitat, the structure of the habitat that those birds need. So as we think about what are we going to be doing in the future on bird conservation, I think we need to think broader about who we engage and just our mindset around what it's all about. It's gonna be all hands on deck. It's not just landowners and people that are um, making those decisions about what happens on a piece of land. I think it needs to involve everybody because what's conservation? People. people. And it's all segments of people and of the population. 
So some examples of things that, that um, Audubon Vermont has been working on um, over the last 10 years or so to kind of create this culture of forest bird conservation that can involve all sorts of different people. Uh, Foresters for the Birds is a, is a project that we worked in partnership with the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation back in uh, 2008. We got this, this started up to really engage the forestry community of Vermont in understanding the important role, one, that our forests play in global bird conservation efforts as we think about migratory species. We do play a, a global importance here in our forests as well as how do um, some of the specific silvicultural treatments that we utilize in our northern hardwoods and mixed wood forests, what are the implications of that from a forest bird habitat perspective? And create that awareness and, and build that, um, that collaboration between the forestry community and the bird conservation community and the landowners on the ground. Because believe it or not, that relationship between all those people hasn't always been, we haven't all been holding hands and singing kumbaya around trees, historically. Um, but we're there now, I think. I think we're getting there. Uh, so involving the forestry community as part of this to create this culture has been a big uh, and important part of things. One of the aspects of, of the Foresters for the Birds was to come up with um, what we call the toolkit, which was a, a set of three publications that was designed for foresters to put in their vest pockets so that they could relate to their clients, landowners, um, who have that interest in birds and other wildlife um, on how to look at the forest, do an inventory, and consider how the forest um, attributes provide habitat. Um, we had a bird guide um, called uh, Birds with Silviculture in Mind, which not only looked at 12 of our priority species um, that we were focused on in our efforts, but also what sorts of silvicultural practices could be used to enhance habitat for those species, whether it be young forest creation or thinking about maintaining that mature forest but enhancing its structure along the way. And then actually coming up with some silvicultural um, prescriptions or recommendations that could be used to bring together timber and habitat at the same time. We're also engaging um, landowners, certainly in our efforts in providing technical assistance. So um, Elizabeth mentioned Woods, Wildlife, and Warbler is a project that we've been involved in. Um, uh, also, um, we've been help working with Cold Hollow to Canada um, up in the northern part of the state. So we, Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers was in the southern part of the state, Cold Hollow to Canada, the northern part of the state, working with private landowners who are thinking about or interested in birds and wildlife. And with Cold Hollow to Canada in particular, uh, we're really working with that climate change piece as a big part of how do we tie together birds and climate. They work really well to think about together um, as we provide recommendations um, for landowners. And, you know, 80% of Vermont is in private ownership. About 63% of that ownership is the private family ownership who are interested by and large in birds or wildlife. So we have this ready-made audience right there. Um, and it's certainly an important component to, to continue to work with. And then we have some folks that are out there in the forest who may have not thought about birds a whole lot as they're out managing the landscape um, for other purposes. And in particular, Vermont, we have to think about maple syrup production because we are maple, the number one producer of syrup in the country. Close to 50% of the, the U.S. crop of syrup comes out of here every year. Um, so to, to help to, to bring this segment of forest ownership to bird conservation, five years ago we, we dove into this project called the Bird Friendly Maple Project to help maple producers think about what can I do when I'm managing for sap production that will also be a benefit to bird populations. And on top of that then, not just create that awareness, but provide, hopefully, a market-based incentive for encouraging people to think about managing for the, the habitat elements that those birds are going to be looking for. So we have um, labels that people pr that are participating in this project can put on their containers. They have signage. I, I absolutely love that photo on the right. Um, that's from uh, Steve Wheeler and his Jed's Maple Products up in Derby. They were in the 4th of July parade um, up in Derby a couple years ago, and that was their float. Um, as one of our participating producers. So that, to me, Steve Wheeler and Jed's Maple, um, they haven't traditionally been thinking about birds and bird conservation. They're um, obviously interested in their forest and in producing syrup, 
And we were able to engage them, and now they, they, I have another slide, a picture I could have put up here. It has Steve Wheeler with his bird puppet now that he uses to do programs for kids that come and visit them during sugaring season. So they're really bringing this bird idea. They've really embraced it. Um, and it's a segment of, of the people that we haven't really brought into this, this discussion before. And we're trying to do that now through, through this particular project. And then certainly um, on the policy end of things, as, as the threats uh, continue to mount on, on this sort of, uh, of aspect of bird conservation, um, that birds can't vote, but you can. Uh, so if you're not a landowner, you're not a maple producer, you're not someone who's, who makes management decisions, you're just a general person that lives here and has your livelihood, um, you are still part of this bird conservation um, objective, and you can do many things to help support that. This is a, um, a science uh, um, rally that happened down in Boston. That's Mass Audubon uh, folks that were participating in that there. So this, again, is speaking to the fact that bird conservation needs, it's going to take a village. Everybody has to be brought into this, coming to it where, where we can meet them, where, what are their interests, and what are they going to be able to contribute to this, this effort. Um, if we do these sorts of things, we can somewhat be more proactive, I think, in our conservation. So, so kind of historically, our conservation has been more reactionary. We have species in decline. Um, we need to do things to try to re reverse that decline and, and keep it going. Um, and that could take a lot of resources. Hopefully it's successful, but, but sometimes it, it hasn't been successful. So if we think about the, the forest itself, and we actually broaden our thinking to think about not just the species at risk, but all those bird species that are out there, even those that, that in some cases are do, still doing quite well, we're being proactive and we might be more effective. We'll use less resources perhaps in making sure that they persist on the landscape as opposed to trying to bring them back from a population that's declined. So these are some of the forest birds that um, often don't show up on like the, they're not rare, threatened, or endangered species. But they're absolutely, uh, the, the northern forest region is an absolutely critical part of making sure that they do well and persist here on the landscape. And to wrap it up, I'm going to start with, end with where I started, the people piece. Um, because once again, it's all of these kinds of people and more that I really believe we need to shift our thinking towards to engage in bird conservation in order for us to address those larger scale threats that are somewhat new or becoming even more um, impactful uh, on birds moving into the future. It's up there. Questions? Yeah, we have time for one question. Yeah. Um, we're a lucky guy. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of decades ago, the mantra was forest interior birds. My two-part question was, is there such a thing? And does anyone still care about that, considering all this sort of hands-on management that we're seeing? Yes, there is such a thing, um, interior forest birds. In fact, the, uh, those species are interior forest birds. Um, so interior forest is essentially, you know, you're getting deep into the forest, away from a non-forest edge, where certain species do reach higher abundance or greater nesting success when they're in there. A lot of the work that, that Audubon's doing in those programs I just mentioned is management focused on those interior forest birds. So maintaining a more closed canopy, a more mature forest, but enhancing the structural attributes of that forest that these different birds are tying into. So it's very much a thing. Um, and I would say historically, though, you mentioned about a decade or so ago that that was a big topic. Uh, I would say historically, if we go back further than that, they, haven't, they weren't always part of the, the thinking in wildlife management or, 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 or bird, bird conservation. Yep. Thanks, Steve. Okay.